What's up, everyone? Well, today I'm going to try to do two things at once. One, I'm going to pull a bunch of the leaves off of this Zelkova forest, which is looking really pretty, but a lot of them are starting to just sort of brown out and uh, fall off by themselves. So I figure I've enjoyed it for long enough. And the second is I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about, in retrospect, uh, some of the things that happened at the Pacific Bonsai Expo. So the Pacific Bonsai Expo happened uh, November 12th and 13th at the Bridgeyard in Oakland, California. And I was the co-organizer along with Jonas Dupuy uh, of BonsaiTonight.com. And uh, we've known each other for a long time, having both studied with Boone Manicativa Park uh, for many years as part of the Bay Island Bonsai Club. And so, we decided that we were going to put together a show uh, that would be juried. In other words, you have to submit a picture of the tree in order to have it accepted to the show. Uh, and then we hired three jurors, uh, very famous bonsai professionals in the United States, uh, Ryan Neal, Bjorn Bjorholm, and uh, William Valvanis from New York. And, uh, they actually were the ones that selected the trees and then <laughs> it was pretty amazing from there some of the momentum that the show um, gained but apart from the show in general I wanted to specifically talk about so I've shared in a couple of videos in the last couple of months some of my show prep that went into a couple of my trees but I had a special exhibit in the uh, show and it was really special to me and and there's a lot of history to it a lot of sort of backstory. So um, let's start with a, a trip to visit Linda Mahara, who is the owner of uh, Paper Tree in Japantown in San Francisco, and check out uh, some of the origami that she's doing that is gonna be part of my exhibit, or was part of my exhibit, at the, uh, at the 2022 Pacific Bonsai Expo. Hello. Good oh, I'm gonna. Um, oh my goodness. I'm gonna. I brought some birds, and Wait. I'm gonna film a bunch of stuff. If that's okay with you. Oh sure. Yeah. So I, I sent you. I think I sent you like. You one, sent me the video. One. So were you able to hang all of the ones, all the extras? This bag didn't get hung, but everything else did. That's fantastic. All right. So you're gonna so, fold one. I yeah. The base of this is actually the, um, the crane base, which is a really difficult maneuver to do this exact step here, where you actually turn it into a pedal fold. And there's lots of different ways to do that. It's like the hardest thing to illustrate in a diagram. Yeah, the diagrams, the, th the lack of three dimensionality and the yep. diagrams make it difficult. Yep. That's the challenge of origami, you know, diagramming. You have to. Uh, be able to, um, you know. I think YouTube videos are much better. Some are. Um, you have to be mindful of the position of your finger so you don't actually block the fold maneuver, mm. which is um, what a lot of people have a, an issue with. Um, so, so far that looks like some sort of Star Wars thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so actually there's a couple of things that I did. To make it funny, funny how spacecraft and airplanes and birds all look kind of the same. Got the wing thing going on. Oh, this goes in. I'm already lost. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, what? this there's there's a pre-crease. I don't even know whether you're working on the tail or the head. <laughs> yeah, this is the tail, and actually, it does require scissors, which I should go get here. You know, I think people think about like origami as just folding, but you're actually kind of like almost massaging the paper into place. Like there's some folds that aren't really folds. There, it, it is paper sculpture, Yeah. you know, and it's how you maneuver it, whether you do a straight folding or whether you do a curved fold or a shaping, you know, um, 
because when you're doing representational origami, which is what this is, you know, you, nature is, has a lot of soft edges. It doesn't have straight edges. So you have to be able to shape it when the structure is made to make sure that it does have that soft feel and lifelike quality, you know. So there's, um, that's where the artistry comes in. So this actually is shaped. This is the, the pinch maneuver. It creates the head. The wings get folded up, depending on which way you want to go. You could just do a straight fold up like this. Then this gets split. Let me remove that extra thing. So that was about four to five minutes to make one. It doesn't, it doesn't take that long. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> when, if you have it memorized. When, when you make 600, it probably takes you a little bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> so once Linda had the, uh, all of the swallows folded and um, strung onto, well, once she had them all folded, they were then strung onto very fine wires that she used in order to uh, Kind of have them form lines essentially to make it easier to install them when we got to the expo location on uh, on thursday two days before the show actually was set to open we only had a certain amount of time so we couldn't do we had to do a lot of prep in order to get those ready and linda showed up to do the installation and we started by hanging a large grid up on the up on the ceiling with some rope to give us lots of different anchor points. And then we started stringing together those uh, strings of birds and positioning them in, in, into kind of a murmuration, which was the idea. So conceptually, the let me talk a little bit about the, the exhibit that I put together. And when I was a beginner, um, my background in bonsai really started from my childhood, which I think is, is true for a lot of people. My parents were both avid gardeners, uh, but I grew up in a very rural area, uh, Mendocino County here in Northern California. And uh, for example, I only had, I think it was 32 people in my graduating class uh, in my high school. So the, the school was very small. And that was really a product of the fact that we were out kind of in the middle of nowhere. But uh, having grown up way out in the country, I, I have a lot of sort of personal background with interacting with trees. There were lots of redwood trees and uh, California native oaks and buckeyes and uh, all those sorts of things around me as I was growing up. And so my reference point in relating to nature really had to do with California, uh, California flora. Uh, and, and I really didn't have hardly any interaction with Asian culture uh, as, as a young person. And so when I got into bonsai, I was told that John Naka, who is a famous, I'm sure all of you guys know who John Naka is, but I'll, he's, you know, from the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, he was a very well-regarded uh, bonsai teacher from the Los Angeles area. And he wrote a book called Bonsai Techniques and then a couple of other books. And he also is famous for a number of quotes, one of which is, that you should leave enough room between the branches of your trees, the branches of your bonsai, to allow a bird to fly through. So I think that saying might be based on some sort of traditional proverb. I'm actually not sure what the origin of it is, whether he, he actually entirely made it up or whether it came from some Asian culture or you know some something in his background and if you know the answer to that question i'd actually be interested to hear it but in any case uh, you know there was a lot of sort of reverence for naka's teaching when i was uh, first getting into bonsai in around 2002 and i wasn't really sure i i approached bonsai from a 
from the perspective of someone who grew up in California and really wanted to see bonsai done with California natives. And in Southern California, they have been for many years using California junipers as bonsai, which are uh, make really good specimen trees. And Naka and many of his students were working with those trees. But once I actually started critically thinking about uh, the the sort of traditional teachings in bonsai that, that you could find in books at the time, and this was not pre-internet, but before the time of social media and, you know, information flying around the globe quite as quickly as it does these days. I sort of read these these sayings and I I asked myself when when I came across Naka's quote about birds, I said, is the is how big was the bird? Is the bird in scale with the tree? In other words, you know, if these were 50 foot tall trees, the bird would only be maybe a quarter of an inch to scale or something like that. Uh, whereas, or, or is the bird actually a full size bird? And he's saying that you need to leave enough space in order for a full size bird to fly through a miniature tree. I've never actually, you know, received an answer to that, but maybe I didn't a ask the right person. And so, in, in my contemplation of that question for many years, it, it kind of dawned on me that the, the, question, the question is a little bit ridiculous, but, but so is the proverb. So I, I decided to create a display that incorporated 600 origami birds with two different junipers of different sizes. So I, I like making really small trees. And as it turns out, the, the species of bird that I wanted to use was a tree swallow. Tree swallows are native to California and they, they migrate uh, in and out of the state depending on the time of year. And they also create murmurations. So I was kind of thinking of a murmuration of tree swallows made out of origami. And the reason I wanted them to be made out of origami is that I kind of think of Naka's, all of the thoughts and all of the things that Naka put into his teachings and into his books and whatnot as having taken on a life of their own. In other words, I can't go talk to John Naka. He passed away a number of years ago and maybe when I was a beginner I could have, but uh, I can't go talk to him now. And so the, the idea is that he uh, set out in his, in his books and to his students and whatnot have kind of taken, off, taken on a life of their own. And so my display showed his book essentially the pages of his book uh, departing from the book and taking on a life of their own, each one being maybe representative of a thought uh, or an idea that Naka communicated to his students and, and through his book to, to many, many people. Um, and, and so there's sort of like a, a number of different uh, number of different ways to look at the display, but in collaboration with Linda, we put together this display as part of the Pacific Bonsai Expo. This is actually kind of a really interesting process uh, as these trees are getting more, more and more dense. Um, there are more and more leaves and it takes longer and longer every year. And don't think that I'm complaining. I find this planting to be absolutely uh, delightful at this point. I think I started it in 2015, so it's maybe seven years old. Maybe it was 2014. So more broadly, the Pacific Expo was uh, a great success, I think. And, you know, we had a couple, at, hmm, I'm going to say 1,500 people visit over the course of two days and a lot of a lot of happy vendors and customers buying bonsai trees from myself and many other vendors as well as enjoying the exhibit and uh, if I if I got a chance to see you in person uh, that was like really really fun for me to meet a lot of people who maybe I'd only interacted with online up to that point uh, many people flying in from all over the country and it it's kind of if you've never been to a national level show you probably would have your mind blown by the quality of the trees that were in the expo and also just the the number of trees so like maybe you see good quality trees uh, in pictures on Instagram or other places and 
those are really inspiring, but seeing them in person and one of the things that I think was really a success for the expo was that we held the, we held the expo in a venue that had a lot of natural light uh, that allowed the sort of the viewing of the trees to be different during different times of the day. So starting at seven o'clock in the morning, there was just soft light on it, sort of the golden hour, you know, that photographers talk about. And then on through the, the days, the sunlight that was coming in through the high windows kind of slanting uh, down into the venue onto some of the trees, it moved throughout the day. And that meant that at you know one hour, the sun might be in one spot, one part of the exhibit, and the next hour it was in another part of the exhibit. And so you got really different feeling, almost, I mean, much more like a, a, a visit to a, a bonsai yard rather than a visit to a bonsai or a visit to like a, a museum or something like that where the art where the light is all artificial. As delightful as this fall foliage is, as I remove the leaves, I think uh, it just continues to change. Uh, and one of the things that was really interesting about the show was that the timing of the show was intended to give us a good shot at showing off trees at peak fall color. And we had, uh, I, I'm gonna say 20 displays uh, that were that significantly included deciduous trees and of those only a few actually ended up having really good fall color but the ones that did were just absolutely amazing and it was it was a real treat to see both trees in fall color where you get to really appreciate the the colors of the leaves as they turn uh, but not so much the structure of the tree and other trees in in bare twig where you really get to enjoy the, the detailed work that people have put into their trees and all of the, the preparation that has gone uh, into all of that. It takes many years worth of effort to, to create a good deciduous tree, which is not to discount other you know, conifers or anything like that, but the this really fine twigging that I'm getting with these um, with these zelkovas is really fun to see, and it's on an entirely different scale. I have a small zelkova that it just has a really different feeling, and one of the things about this <laughs> forest that's just turned out to be completely unexpected and delightful is that uh, each tree has a slightly different fall color, and it's interesting to note that the year to year each one of the trees the color is consistent so this one is always one of the most red ones this one is always sort of a more golden kind of color uh, as we get into the fall and the leaves don't fall off of each one all at the same time in other words like some of the trees will start to change fall color first and then be mostly done while others are still in the midst of uh, of their color changing and this year has been some of the best fall color that I've ever gotten in San Francisco because we had apparently the second coldest October on record, which, you know, if you've traveled to San Francisco, usually it's warmer in October than it is in August, um, which I think the, the cool October weather really helped to, um, <laughs> really helped to provide some good fall, fall color on some of my trees. Now, as I get in here with these tweezers, it's a little bit, uh, <laughs> a little bit difficult, which I guess is a good thing. Interesting also, some of these trees seem to have finer twigging. This one has more twigging than uh, most of the other ones, even though they were all started kind of the same time and been treated largely the same.
All right, well, that took a little while to get all the leaves off, but uh, not even a whole lot of trimming to do either. It looks like I did a pretty good job of trimming it during the season this year. So uh, maybe just a few minor cleanups of long shoots that are on the interior here. It's interesting when you have a forest that's this large, or maybe I should say with this many trees, that sometimes you'll get a shoot from like the base of like this one coming all the way out through all of the other trees. And uh, so you have to cut all of those back when you when you actually figure out that it's from one of the from one of the trees that's not on the edge of the forest. Well, thanks to everyone who attended the expo. And if you didn't get a chance, I hope that this video showed you some of the highlights. And uh, if you want to pick up photos, uh, professionally done photos of the expo, we have a book available at PacificBonsaiExpo.com. Right now it's pre-sale, but by the time you're watching this, it might be on regular sale. You can pick that up. And if you want to get an origami swallow, we also are offering those as a fundraiser. We'll ship out an origami swallow to you from PacificBonsaiExpo.com. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you like this uh, Zelkova forest. Hope you enjoyed the expo footage. See you next time.